This video is brought to you by Surfshark. Safety and security online are critically important. You can protect yourself online with Surfshark. Get 83% off and three months for free through the link in the description below. When we think about the defining locations that helped shape World War II, we're almost spoiled for choice. Normandy, North Africa, Okinawa, Midway, Pearl Harbor, Stalingrad, and Dunkirk are all names that will be forever associated with the most brutal conflict that the world has ever seen. But for all these cataclysmic theaters of conflict, there were many more locations we simply don't know about, where hundreds of thousands worked tirelessly for the greater good on one side or the other. From the factory employees churning out bullets and tanks, to radar operators and the dock workers on the US East Coast frantically filling ships destined for Europe. And this is a story of one such location, a place set in the calm, undulating hills of Middle England, a place called Bletchley Park. At first glance today, Bletchley Park looks like many of the other stately homes dotted around the UK, grand, well kept, and more than a splash of Downton Abbey to the place. But this was also the site of one of the most extraordinary feats of World War II, and one which undoubtedly helped tip the tide of war in the favor of the Allies. It was here that the previously thought unbreakable Enigma machine finally met its match. Almost all communication sent back and forth during World War II was coded to some degree or another. After all, what good are secret tactical maneuvers if the enemy already knows what's coming? Some nations were more adept at this than others, but almost everybody slipped up at some point. While commanders liked to imagine their tactics were closely guarded secrets, the reality was that through spies, enemy reconnaissance, misplaced maps, and of course code breaking, many missions were known about in advance. But the Germans were pretty good at keeping their secrets close to their chest, and pivotal to this, was the Enigma machine. What looked like a glorified, old-fashioned typewriter, the Enigma machine was the scourge of the Allies for many years. Like a typewriter, it came with 26 keys corresponding to the letters of the alphabet with a set of 26 lights, again with the letters of the alphabet above. Also included was an electromechanical rotor mechanism located between the letters and the lights. This included three separate rotors, a fourth was later added, which could be rotated into a position that corresponded to the letters beside them. So rotor one had 26 possibilities, as did Rota 2, and so on. Now, I could spend many hours going through the mechanical proceeds of the Enigma machine, but, well, we've got a lot to get to, so let me just summarize. The Germans changed the rotor settings daily, but if you had the correct rotor positions, you could type in encrypted messages that would sound like gibberish, and the Enigma machine would translate it into readable text. But alas, that was only half of it. On the front of the Enigma machine was the plug board, which looked a bit like one of those old-fashioned switchboards that telephone operators used to use. The plug board contained small holes with the letters A to Z, and a typical Enigma code would use 10 different randomized pairs that needed to be connected via small wires on top of the rotors that needed to be in the correct position. The result is a difficult to comprehend 159 quintillion possible combinations. The Enigma machine was considered unbreakable by the Nazis, so much so that even the most top secret communications were often sent via the Enigma. But with odds like that, you can understand their confidence. All right, to start the story, we need to backtrack a bit, because while the Enigma machine rose to fame during World War II, it was invented shortly after the First World War. It was quite rudimentary at that point, but was commonly used across the German armed forces throughout the 1920s and 1930s. As we know, things started to go a little Aryan nation in Germany in the 1930s, and many of its neighbors began eyeing it a bit suspiciously. One of these was Poland, where they were able to build their own Enigma machines based on German cipher materials obtained by a French spy, Hans Thilio Schmidt. With these machines, they were able to break some Nazi codes, but with war looming, the Germans added more rotors to their enigmas and the Poles simply couldn't keep up. Just two months before the invasion of their country, the Poles gave a crash course to members of the British and French intelligence services in their enigma-breaking techniques. Very few people knew about the exchange of information that took place on the 26th and 27th of July 1939 in Piri near Warsaw, but it was a meeting that would have a profound effect on World War II.
Not a whole lot went well for the Allies in the early stages of the war. Scores of German military successes saw them roar across Europe, and by mid-1940, most of the continent lay under the control of the Nazis. But at Bletchley Park, which housed the government's code and cipher school, GC and CS, there was some early success. Alan Turing, a brilliant mathematician and computer scientist, had arrived at Bletchley Park in 1939, the very day on which Britain had declared war on Nazi Germany. He had been working part-time for the GC and CS since 1938, but with the outbreak of the war, his genius was called upon full-time. He may not have always been the easiest person to work with, but Turing was a man who made an enormous impact on World War II. Now, if you want better encryption capabilities than the Nazis, it's time to check out today's video sponsor, Surfshark. Do you use the internet? Well, of course you do. You're on the internet right now. Do you have personal information that you'd rather remain private? Well, who doesn't? Let me tell you something. The internet is all kind of weird. There are people out there who want to ruin your day. They want to take your details, steal your identity. That's a thing. It's a pain in the ass. Surfshark has Hacklock. This searches databases for your passwords, which sounds bad. But don't worry, Surfshark are the good guys if they find it, they'll let you know so you can change that password and then you're back in the warm comfort of safety. And while you're in that warm comfort of safety, maybe you're like, hmm, let's watch some Netflix. Oh, I found a movie that I really want to see, but it's not on my local Netflix. It's only available in the UK. Well, just get on Surfshark, flip over your VPN to the UK and boom. Watch that movie until your heart is content. Also, Surfshark is totally unlimited. So if you want to download a movie in like Roar 8K or something for whatever reason, well, go nuts. You absolutely can. There's no cap. Also, if you get started with Surfshark and you're like, ah, oh, it's not really for me, I don't think you'll run into that, but there's a 30 day money back guarantee. You can get 83% off and three months for free through the link in the description below, or just use my code MEGA at checkout. Let's get back to the Enigma machine. Much of the code-breaking magic that happens at Bletchley Park began at least in Hut 8, little more than a small shack where the secrets of Nazi Germany were slowly uncovered. Just weeks after arriving at Bletchley Park, Turing decided that the best, and perhaps only way, to beat the Enigma machine was to build another machine that could match it. The idea to build an electromechanical machine called the Bomb, based on the Polish design which had been built before the war, raised some eyebrows. While machines were certainly being used, they were still in their infancy, and much of the hard code-breaking work was still done by the good old human brain. But Turing correctly reasoned that to break the thousands of German messages quickly and efficiently, British intelligence would have to go automatic. By March 1940, the first British bomb, ambitiously named Victory, was up and running at Bletchley Park. This machine didn't actually decode the messages themselves, but rather shifted through the countless potential possibilities for the adjustable rotors and plug board to find the appropriate key for that day. Once the key was found, in theory, all the messages received on that day could then be decoded. The problem was that different Enigma codes were used used across the German armed forces. These were big machines, measuring 2.1 meters wide, 1.98 meters tall, and 0.61 meters deep, and weighed about a ton. Each had space on the front for 108 small drums, arranged in three groups of 12 triplets. Each triplet corresponded to the three rotors of an Enigma scrambler, and essentially these drums would mimic a human testing every possible option, but in a fraction of the time. On the first bombs, the drums rotated at a speed of 50.4 RPM, while the later versions tore around at 120 RPM and were able to test all 17,576 possible positions for one rotor order in just 20 minutes. The second bomb, named Agnes Day, later shortened to Agnes or Aggie, was installed in August 1940. In 1940 alone, the two bombs successfully broke the German codes 178 times, while bomb outstations were established at Adstock, Gayhurst, and Wievenden, all close to Bletchley Park, in case it was hit during a bombing raid. While things were progressing nicely at Bletchley, it was still a painstakingly slow process. What would really speed things up was if the Allies could capture Enigma keys from their German foes without the Germans realizing and changing the keys. It sounds far-fetched, but it actually happened several times. The first came on the 26th of April 1940, when a German patrol boat disguised as a Dutch trawler was captured by the HMS Griffin off the Norwegian coast. Perhaps taken by surprise, the German crew on board failed to destroy their crypto information, and suddenly the British were in possession of some of the Enigma keys 
from the 23rd to the 26th of April. These keys were rushed back to Bletchley Park, where they were utilized along with the bomb machines. Over the next two months, Turing and those working with him were able to break six days of naval traffic between the 22nd and the 27th of April 1940. Of course, at this point, the information was well out of date, but this represented the first time Bletchley Park had broken the Kriegsmarine German Navy messages. And it's probably worth pointing out here that the German Navy was by far the biggest threat to the Allies as it continued to decimate the merchant fleet moving between the United States and Britain. The second capture of Enigma material came on the 9th of May 1941 in the icy waters off Greenland and has come to be known as Operation Primrose. The U-boat U-110 had traveled northwest from France to intercept convoy OB-318 moving from the U.S. to Britain. The German submarine successfully sank the Esmond and Bengor Head, but it faced a fierce barrage from the convoy's escort ships and the U-boat was eventually forced to surface. The ocean surface, when you're surrounded by enemy ships with all their guns pointed at you, is just about as bad as it gets for a submarine, and that's exactly what U-110 faced as it broke the surface. As the crew gathered on the deck, they came under fire from the British British boats who believed that the deck gun was about to be used. Once it became clear that the German sailors were surrendering, the shooting stopped and those on the deck began swimming towards the waiting boats. One of those in the water was Captain Fritz Julius Lemp. Now we have to speculate a little here, but it seems as if Lemp had been sure that the U-110 was about to sink. But as he paddled away from the stricken U-boat, he apparently realized that the submarine was very much still floating, and no doubt his second thought was of the top-secret crypto information still on board. Lemp is said to have turned around and headed back to the U-boat, but he never made it, and he was never seen again. The British boarded the U-110 and stripped it of everything worthwhile, including the submarine's Kurd Signal codebook and its Enigma machine. The Allies couldn't believe their luck, and once again the information was rushed back to the small shack at Bletchley Park. As in poker, sometimes you just need to go all in, and that was exactly what Turing and his codebreakers did in 1941 with a carefully worded letter to the right man. By the summer of 1941, there were four to six bombs at Bletchley Park, with a total of 24 to 30 in the local area, but this was still not enough. The torrent of information coming in was enormous, and the allocation of funding and personnel was seen as inadequate by the code breakers in order to keep up. Military rules are fairly explicit about the chain of command. You never go above your direct superior. But in October of 1941, the code breakers did, and not only that, they went to the very top. In their letter to Prime Minister Winston Churchill, the code breakers bluntly stated that their work was being held back and sometimes not being done at all because of a lack of resources. It was an audacious move, but one that paid off. Churchill had visited Bletchley Park shortly before and was already convinced of the team's excellent work. From then on, budget issues and a lack of personnel were things of the past. Just to give you a quick idea of how quickly they were built, in December 1943 there were 87 bombs, a year later at the end of 1944, 152, and by the end of the war the number had peaked at 155. These bombs were operated by a legion of women from the Women's Royal Navy Service, known as Wrens. But while this might give the impression of smooth sailing, it really wasn't. The huge increase in bomb numbers was partly because in 1942 the German High Command ordered that a fourth rotor be added to all the Enigma machines. This threw a real spanner in the works and led to the longest information blackout since those at Bletchley Park had began breaking the Enigma codes. The role of the bomb machines proved invaluable to breaking the Enigma codes, but it was human input that began to fill the gaps. While an Enigma message may have appeared to be nothing but gibberish, there were patterns if you looked hard enough. The codebreakers knew the Germans sent weather reports every day, which meant that the word weather was included frequently. Most German messages also ended with the phrase Heil Hitler, and once the British discovered that all numbers were being spelt out rather than simply stating the numerical number, they were able to go back and look at past messages and begin seeing similarities. This was by no means enough to read a whole message, but little by little, their understanding of Enigma grew. Another quite obvious fact, when you think about it, but one that was missed for a while, was that no letter was ever encrypted as itself. An A couldn't be encrypted as an A, for example, which, when combined across a whole message, began to lower potential possibilities. The work done at Bletchley Park and the countless satellite stations surrounding it had a staggering impact on the war. The only argument, it would seem, was just how much of an impact. Even as early as 1943, the codebreakers were cracking 84,000 Enigma messages a month, equal to two each minute. The information gathered by the codebreakers was referred to as ultra-intelligence, and the powers that be guarded the information carefully. Even top commanders were often kept in the dark regarding the source of select information. 
The quite obvious problem was, how do you exploit the information without revealing that you've cracked the code? Time and time again, German suspicions led to a change in keys or, as I mentioned, the installation of a fourth rotor. There were several instances where the Allies had prior knowledge of events or attacks and chose not to pass on the information to troops on the ground or at sea. The painful reality was that code breakers often knew that soldiers or merchant sailors were about to be attacked, but for the greater good, no action could be taken. But that's not to say it wasn't carefully utilized. Information regarding Erwin Rommel's intentions in North Africa was passed on to commanders on the ground and proved invaluable in finally defeating the most feared commander in the German Wehrmacht. The formidable German vessel Bismarck was finally sunk using information from broken Enigma machines, while the Allies were able to use them to assess German defensive capabilities before D-Day. Enigma was also used to plot U-boat patterns in the Atlantic Ocean, which unquestionably saved many ships and countless lives in the process. By 1945, almost all Enigma codes being sent across the three German military arms were being decoded within a day or two. The Allies were able to read direct communications between German commanders as the Allies swept across the continent at breakneck speed. The question of whether the work of the Enigma code breakers shortened the war is one that historians come back to time and time again. Some say a year, others say two. And when you put it like that, what happened in the leafy tranquility of Buckinghamshire, just north of London, may well have been some of the most important work across the entire war. Now, it's easy to focus on the bombs and their relentless search for the Enigma codes, but this is a story that has quite extraordinary human actions throughout. Inexplicably, the role of the Polish code breakers is often overlooked. Simply put, much of this may never even have happened if the Poles had not had the foresight to construct their own Enigma machines and pass on everything they knew to the Allies just months before Poland was overrun. The work of Marian Rajewski, Heinrich Zagalski, and Jerzy Rosicki, which began in 1932, a year before Hitler became Chancellor of Germany, laid the foundations for everything that was to come. While there were thousands of unsung heroes working to decipher Enigma, we often come back to Gordon Welchman and, of course, Alan Turing, two men with vastly different personalities and temperaments and who experienced two very different post-war experiences. Welchman, who had been instrumental in the further developments of the bombs, eventually moved to the US and became a professor at MIT before passing away at the age of 79. The story of Alan Turing is altogether darker. In 1952, he was charged with gross indecency relating to a homosexual act, which was still a criminal offense in the UK at the time. He pled guilty and escaped jail term on the condition that he undergo chemical castration to reduce his libido and cure his homosexuality. Two years later, his housekeeper discovered his body amid his messy apartment. He had committed suicide by taking cyanide at the age of just 41. It wasn't until 2012 that the British government officially pardoned Alan Turing nearly 60 years after his death. For a long time, his full involvement with the Enigma code breaking wasn't known. The operation wasn't declassified until the 1970s, but today Turing is rightly revered as one of the most extraordinary British mathematicians and computer scientists. One man can't win a war, but one man can certainly make a truly remarkable contribution. So I do hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. Don't forget to subscribe. And as always, thank you for watching.